it's the autumn garden tips, but how can we make them as easy for ourselves as possible? It's Alexandra here from the Middle Size Garden YouTube channel and blog. And I'm looking at whether there's only really one way to plant a plant. Do you have to dig up your dahlias? And is it too late to trim topiary? I'll put links to any resources we mention in the description below, along with plant names and timestamps, so you can jump to whichever part of the video you'd like to. And if you're new here, the Middle Sized Garden uploads weekly with tips, ideas and inspiration for your garden. So if you'd like to see the videos when you open up YouTube, tap the subscribe button, they're free. And if you'd like YouTube to tell you when a new video is uploaded, tap the notifications bell. The great thing about autumn is that it's a very good time for planting trees, shrubs and perennials. It used to be said that autumn and spring were a good time to plant. However, we've had some very dry springs recently and a number of the professional gardeners that I talk to have said that they're doing their main planting in autumn now. And in actual fact, you often can plant plants in summer or in winter, but of course not if the ground's frozen and in summer it may be very hot and dry and that'll put the plants under pressure and that means they're less likely to survive. So as with so many things in gardening, there's a best way to do it and then there's a just about managing way to do it. I've often said gardeners learn by trial and error and so it's a question of finding out what's right for you, for your lifestyle, for your budget, for the time you've got and for what you want to achieve. So let's start with planting a plant. The traditional way of planting a plant is to dig a hole the depth of the root ball and as wide as possibly twice or even three times the diameter of the roots and then to loosen the soil around. You then place the plant into the hole that you've dug and you add a mixture of soil and compost and backfill. And the principle behind this is that the roots will find it much easier to go through the loose, newly planted soil than they would if they were having to sort of fight through your established border. The way I do it is the no dig, no till way. And there's a video about that, which I'll put in the description below, um, which I've done with Charles Dowding about no till, no dig for flower borders. And the general principle of no dig, no till is that you only dig if you really need to and you only dig a hole as large as you need to. So you would dig a hole the size of the root ball and no bigger, and you wouldn't loosen the soil around it. And the principle of that is that if your soil's in good condition, the roots will find no trouble in going through that soil and establishing themselves. And to keep your soil in good condition, just don't dig it unless you have to. And once a year, you need to put two to three inches of garden compost or well-rotted manure in a layer on top, don't dig it in, and then that will feed the microorganisms in the soil and feed the soil and improve the soil structure. So you shouldn't have to need to loosen the soil around the hole. I personally do the no dig, no till method because it's easier. But if you do the traditional method and it works for you, then that's great because of course, one of the things about the traditional tips that we see in the gardening to-do lists is they've worked for a lot of people over a long period of time. In my video, How to Find Plants for Dry, Shady Areas, I pointed out that I had a rather sad triangle in this garden where I had planted rhubarb, which does not like dry, shady spots. So I have been to the garden centre this week to get the plants that do like dry, shady spots. And I do rather wish that UK garden centres would categorise their plants under shade loving and sun loving rather than alphabetical because what alphabetical listings of plants means that you really have to have a pretty good idea of what you want before you go to the garden centre. Now it has to be said that it's very good advice to decide what you want before you go to the garden centre and all the professionals will draw up an approximate plant list. However, a lot of plants have a huge number of varieties. Things like roses, for example, or hoikera or salvias have lots and lots of varieties. And some of those varieties will do well in dry shade and some will not. So you can never guarantee when you go with your list to the garden centre that you'll get exactly what you want. So you may have to look at plants and then check the care labels. And of course, they don't always have care labels. So sometimes you're just flying blind. One thing I would advise is when you come back from a garden centre is check those plants and their care online and see what other people say about them, just to check that you are going to plant them in the right position. I bought a hydrangea quercifolia because hydrangeas do tolerate shade very well. They do, however, usually like moist positions, but hydrangea quercifolia is known as the most drought resistant hydrangea. 
and this one looks as if it's going to be nice and small. It's called Munchkin. The next plant I chose was Hoikeras and it only had the name on the label and no care instructions. So I looked it up on the internet and discovered that it is considered to be drought tolerant and extremely tough. So I'm thrilled with that. It appears to be accidentally exactly the right hoikara for this position. It's called Southern Comfort. And the third plant I chose was a fuchsia. Now this one does look as if it's going to get very tall. It looks as if it's going to get to 2.5 metres, which is taller than me. And so it could occupy the whole of this space just on its own. But the great thing about fuchsias is that you can cut them down to their base in the early spring and then they spring up again, or at least certainly with this fuchsia. And that means that you can combine them really well with spring bulbs. And this dry, shady area does do very well for spring bulbs because it's surrounded by trees that lose their leaves in the winter. So actually, I think this is a good choice for the area. Whether it will be happy in this much shade will be a question of trial and error. I've got a fuchsia in a very shady spot and it's always been rather scrappy but it's next door to the pergola that got very overgrown and when we took away the per pergola and its growth it gave that fuchsia probably about an extra hour of sun so not a huge difference but it's made so much difference to the fuchsia because this fuchsia now and I'm sorry I don't know the name actually has really flourished from just having that little extra bit of light. So once again, experiment. If something's looking a bit scrappy in a shady spot, perhaps just cutting back a few of the plants around it or moving it a little bit further away could make all the difference. The next question is, do you dig up your dahlias? We've had a very mild early autumn here in South East England. We've had average daytime temperatures of about 20 Celsius, that's about 68 Fahrenheit. But in a few weeks time, those temperatures will drop and we're about six weeks away from our first frost date. We very much are equivalent to a USDA hardiness zone of nine because we have very mild winters. We don't have such hot summers as a USDA zone nine does. But in the winter, our temperatures rarely go below minus six Celsius or 21 Fahrenheit. And what this means is that we may not have to dig up our dahlias. If your weather is very much colder than ours, or if it's wetter than ours, we have quite low rainfall, it's about 22 inches a year, then your dahlias will not survive the winter. You'll have to dig them up, take the soil off, and store them somewhere frost-free and dark. However, I've got a video called Don't Dig Up Your Dahlias, which I'll put in the description below. And there's literally hundreds of comments from people all over the world who have succeeded in not digging up their dahlias, even though they do live in slightly colder places than I do. There's no point in trying this. If you live in a USDA hardiness zone six or five or something like that, then don't even think about it. But if you do have quite mild winters and you don't have anywhere to store your dahlias, then it's really worth thinking about leaving them in. You wait until the first frost, you don't have to dig them up until the first frost has blackened the foliage anyway. You take away that blackened foliage and you pile up something like garden compost or well-rotted manure over the crown of the plant to protect it. There is one extra thing I would say, is that dahlias left in the ground for years do sometimes change. I've got two dahlias that really have never changed, that chat noir and preference, and they come back the same year after year. But my two dinner plate dahlias, Babylon Bronze and Labyrinth, have actually emerged this year twice the size that they're supposed to be. The flowers have come back true, so they're still lovely, but it is rather extraordinary that they're now as tall as I am, which is really not what they're supposed to be. And occasionally you will find that either the flower deteriorates if the dahlia is left in for years and years and years at a time, or that it will cross-fertilise with another dahlia and you'll get some sort of odd stripy effects. But it's still, it's a lot of work to dig up dahlias and you may not have anywhere to store them. So it's worth a try. And if you do find that you lose all your dahlias and you haven't got anywhere to store them, uh, then just buy dahlias anew every year, treat them as annuals. So the third job I'm now doing in early autumn is one where I definitely admit I should have done it earlier. In fact, there's two. One is trimming the box topiary and one is trimming back the lavender. Lavender should really be trimmed back not long after it flowered, but we noticed the birds were enjoying it and so we left it and then I'm afraid we forgot about it. But that's what happens in gardening. Sometimes you realise you haven't done something when you should have done. And I think quite often it's worth experimenting with doing it a bit later and seeing what happens. The other thing I do with lavender is that I cut it back really hard. You will see instructions not to cut into the brown wood. 
but sometimes if you look really closely you can see tiny little leaves in that brown wood and provided there are some tiny little leaves the chances are you can cut your lavender back quite hard and it will come back but this lavender is now 10 years old and it's been cut back very hard for at least the last six or seven years which shows that it does help it to go on looking good for longer however if I cut it back this year, I cut it back really hard. I think there's a real chance that I may lose it. However, it's lasted for 10 years and I don't think it owes me anything. The box topiary should also have been cut back variously in early spring, midsummer, early summer or late summer, according to whoever you read. But I'm just going to do it now and I think it should be fine partly because we have these very mild winters. I've certainly cut it back late in the past and I cut the other topiary back in the garden much later than this because it gives them a nice crisp line in winter. So if someone tells you that you must only do something in one particular way, it's always worth finding out whether there is another way of doing it. Most of the traditional ways of gardening have grown up because people have done them for years and years and they've worked for them. So it's always worth trying out a traditional way of doing a gardening job. But it's also worth remembering that your soil, your climate, your lifestyle, your microclimate, and what you want to achieve may be a bit different from someone else's. In the end, we all develop our own gardening style. So let me know what kind of rules you've broken successfully in the comments below. And if you'd like to see more garden tips, there's a garden tips and tours playlist at the end of this video. And thank you for watching. Goodbye.